You're listening to the Smells Like Middle Aged Spirit Podcast. What smells so bad? It's strong, but you'll get used to it. Now, here's your host, Nick Stevenson. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a very special episode of the Smells Like Middle Age Spirit podcast presents Off Script with yours truly. I am your gracious and humble host, Nick Stevenson, and oh my goodness, how great it feels to be back behind the mic. I'm not going to lie. I'm a little nervous. Um, it feels like the first time all over again. Probably had a couple of restarts, if I'm going to be honest with you. But I am very excited to be back behind the mic. Um, it's a good day. Today is May 12th. It's my birthday. I woke up on the right side of the bed today. I woke up feeling good. And I want to share with you a little bit of that feeling. Because I got up, I looked in the mirror, and I sang a little song to myself. It goes a little something like this. What a marvelous time for a podcast. What a beautiful day for the mic. If you're riding in a car real fast or you're strolling along on a bike, just take a deep breath and you'll feel it. It's the spirit that you've come to know. It may be strong, but you'll get used to it. That's the way that it goes on this show. And all the pod magic starts your day with a rush. Got no time for static. I just want you to crush. Can I just do one more podcast for you, my loves? Can I just do one more podcast for you, my loves? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Let's get to it. Please, if you cannot tell, I'm obviously very excited to be back, Um, but it is a little bittersweet, bittersweet feeling, excuse me. It is bittersweet because obviously there's a glaring omission today. Uh, I am not joined by the best damn podcast crew in the biz. Uh, I want to take a moment to acknowledge Joshua Beard, Chris Kahn, and Naomi Richardson for all of their contributions to season three and four, and I have to take the blame. The reason they're not here is because (laughs) <laughs> my life was just getting in the way of us doing this podcast. Um, it became very difficult to match my schedule um, and all of the different goings on. I think we actually had one day where everybody showed up to do the show and there was some drama going on in my house and I had to ask everybody to leave. Um, it's been a tumultuous few months in the Stevenson household. We're doing well though. Like, Um, we're going to get into it a little bit today in today's show. Um, the time came where I was ready to, I was in a good enough place where I could come back and try to cap off this season. I regret that Josh, Chris, and Naomi are not doing that with me. I regret that we won't have a finale, but I want to give them their flowers. Um, I've spoken to Josh and Chris and I've corresponded with all of them via text, but, um, Josh, I know I'm good with uh, Chris. He said, look, I I told everybody, I said, hey, I know we're not doing the show together anymore, but I would really love for us to hang out still and, you know, catch up with one another. And Chris Kahn said, say when? And I said, okay, you want to go to the Roughnecks game this Saturday? And his response was, nah, I'm good. (laughs) Which I'm actually kind of glad we didn't because they got their ass kicked. So that would have been a terrible experience. But um The only person I've not heard from is Naomi. I still, like, I don't think that's because there's anything wrong there. She's a very busy woman. She owns her own business. She's a mother. She works for Laporte Chamber um, of Commerce. So, and she did, you know, she's like small interactions on social media. I know me and, and Naomi are good. Naomi, if you're listening to this, I love you. Thank you so much for everything you did for this show. You were perfect for what me and Chris were looking for when we asked a third host to come on. Um, you always challenged me. We didn't always see eye to eye on everything. You weren't afraid to tell me that. Uh, oftentimes, I think it was probably just a little bit of miscommunication because we still don't know each other very well. 
Um, but you were everything and more that I could have asked for, as well as you, Josh and Chris. And so I just want to give you guys your flowers. And um, this is a three-part series that we're doing or that I'm doing of these off scripts. And uh, and then that's going to cap off season four. And then Smells Like Middle Age Spirit podcast, I honestly don't know what the future of it is. Um, but I wanted to do these three episodes. Number one, to just kind of get back in the groove of getting in the studio and getting on the mic. And I feel like I have something to offer the audience with these uh, next three episodes. So I'm really excited. And I hope you guys will all tune into them. Um, so... That's the reason we're not finishing the season together, though. It's it's pretty much on me and a lot of the things that were going on in this home. And that kind of is a segue into our topic today of the harsh reality of being a parent. Because one of the many reasons we were not podcasting is because I was facing some of those harsh realities. Now, the title of this particular off script is The Harsh Realities of uh being a parent and i'm not gonna lie to you that may be a little bit of a bait and switch we are going to talk about the harsh realities of parenthood but i thought about calling it the harsh yet beautiful realities of being a parent but in this day and age we like controversy we want drama like nobody wants to hear about anything beautiful right there's nothing beautiful on television or in the news we want to hear the grime so I am pulling a little bit of bait and switching you because you guys know how I do. I'm always going to try to find that silver lining, that light at the end of the tunnel. And there are some harsh realities of being a parent. And I've experienced many of them over the last several months. But there's also some beautiful realities, too. And we're going to try to focus on those as we get out of here. So I just want to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, You know, we're still available on all of the platforms that you would normally listen to. Uh, I'm putting out a video episode of this as well. Um, it's just going to be my ugly mug. If you want to see me singing to you earlier, though, that might be entertaining to you. But yeah, all the places, Spotify, Apple, um, YouTube, anywhere you listen to podcasts, um, you'll be able to catch these next uh, few episodes. And I hope you guys enjoy them. All right, so let's get to it. Um, you guys know that when I do these off scripts, I try to kind of rip the curtain back and strip down a little bit more. Not literally. I'm wearing clothes, by the way, if you're. If you're listening and you're wondering, uh, <laughs> you can watch the YouTube. I'm dressed. Um, but I try to strip away any of the pretenses and just be honest about the things that are going on. And I want it, it's important to me to not sound preachy when I'm doing these episodes. I don't do these episodes because I think I know more than the people who are listening. I do these episodes because I hope there's something that I've learned. And when I say I've learned, it's not sometimes it's very recently that I've learned these things. Um, I want you to be able to listen to what I have to say and either take some comfort because maybe you're going through the same thing and it just makes you feel like you're not crazy or your life's not completely terrible. Or maybe, you know, maybe you're not going through as many things as I'm going through and it kind of makes you feel like, all right, I guess I'm doing pretty good. I don't know. The point is never to come off, come across as I am better than, I know more than. I'm really just trying to use my experience to help as many people as I possibly can. And if it's just one or two of you, then that's great. So I just kind of made a list of some of the harsh realities that I've had to come to grips with over the past several months Um, or over the course of being a parent, actually. The first harsh reality that I've had to come to grips with, um, you likely became a parent well before you were ready to. And I know that was the case for me. Um, I have talked about this a little bit, but... Uh, I got married, I was 20 years old, and Madeline was born shortly before my 22nd birthday. If you're a youngster listening to this, maybe you're 16, 17, 18, because I have run into high school age kids who have been listening to this show, you're probably thinking to yourself, oh, like 21, you're an adult, 22, that's that's a grown up. I'm here to tell you right now, I've learned, I'm turning 39 today. I was a child having a child and I was not prepared for what being a parent was going to mean. Um, You know, it's funny because when you're young and your parents are on your nerves, you think I'm just going to do everything the opposite of what they're doing. And I'm, I'll be a better parent than my parents ever were. Well, we're going to touch on that a little bit later, but I, I don't know that there's an age where you are going to be ready to be a parent. 
Like, I don't care if you were 16, 17, 18. You may have been in your 30s. More than likely, you became a parent before you were really ready. Because nothing can prepare you for parenthood except being in it. And that's just the harsh reality of it. Um, and you're going to make some mistakes. Trust me. <laughs> I've made plenty. And that kind of leads me to the next harsh reality that I've had to come to grips with over the years. And that is that the mistakes that you make in parenting, they're going to have lasting effects on your children. They're going to. And not always in a positive way. Uh, I have three kids in therapy right now. <laughs> and I know it's not all because of my parenting and my wife's parenting, but my wife and I, if you talk to us, we'll be honest with you. Like we're still trying to figure this out, you know? have a senior in high school or someone who will be a senior in high school. Um, we have an elementary aged going into junior high. Um, and then our son, if you've listened to the show, it's been kind of documented some issues that we've had. And um, some of the mistakes that we've made uh, regarding him are having lasting effect on him. Um, full transparency uh, my son is actually not living in our home anymore right now. Uh, he is currently staying with his father. And that was a very difficult decision to make. And when you... If you've never been faced with having to make the decision of, is my child living here not good for everyone in this family? It's impossible for you to understand it. As I'm telling it to you right now, I don't expect you to understand it. Many of our family members did not understand it. Like, how could you put your child out of your home? Um, and it's not a great feeling. I, I can be completely honest about that. And once you make that decision, you do a lot of second guessing. You do a lot of thinking about what could I have done better? How did we end up here? Is this my fault? Um, a lot of that goes through your head. And the harsh reality is, yes, some of it is. Um, I came around in Logan's life when he was eight years old. Um, as a, you know, when we blended this family. And yes, there was a lot that had already been, you know, he was eight years old. He had a lot of raising that had already been done, a lot that had already been instilled to him. But I came at a fairly critical time in his life where, I felt like it was still early enough for me to try to instill some of the values that I had grown up with. And sometimes I question just what my methods were. And I don't know. It's tough. It's one of those things, I'll be honest with you, I'm still struggling with and still trying to figure out. Um, I know that the mistakes that I've made in the past have had lasting effects on my oldest. Getting married before I was ready to be a father meant that I was growing up in the middle of trying to raise another child. So we were essentially growing up together. And, you know, a lot of the turmoil that the back and forth relationship that me and her mother had moving around a lot, not being in a stable home, witnessing some of our drama and disagreements. Like, I know that that had a lasting effect on her. She's in therapy to this day. Like, I mean, she knows and her therapist knows a whole lot more than I don't do <laughs> exactly how much that uh, has affected her, but that's the reality of the situation is I know that a lot of my mistakes have had a long, long lasting negative effect on her. Now, I don't know, I don't want to jump the shark, but there are some positives to that as well. Um, but that is a, that is a reality. You are going to make mistakes and your mistakes will have negative effects on your kids. That's just the reality of it. And the same thing happened to us. I'm sure that there's things that our parents did that were not great that have had a lasting effect on us. Um, how you choose to grow from that is really the most important part. And I hope that my children will learn from and grow from the mistakes that I made parenting. And I know that my wife feels the same way. Um, the third harsh reality is that you're more like your parents than you want to admit. And that is the truth. Now, I brought it up earlier. Every single one of us when we were kids, and 
let me just say this. You may be thinking to yourself, Nick, you're crazy. Maybe you're a kid who grew up without a dad in their home. Um, you know, it happens. Maybe you're a young man who didn't grow up with a father and you decided you were going to be nothing like him. And so you're trying to be the best father you can possibly be. I'm, I'm, I, I applaud that. And that's great. What I'm saying is, is little do you know, there's probably some of your father in you <laughs> that you don't realize is there. And I, I'm faced with that reality every day. Every single one of us, when we were a kid, we all said to ourselves as a little shouty, like, when I have a family, I'm going to be such a better parent than my parents ever were. That's possibly what you sounded like. I don't know. But all of us have said it. When I get out of this house, I'm going to be a better parent. I'm never going to whoop my kids or I'm never going to ground my kids. We all think we're going to do better. We all think we're going to be better. And then you realize when you become a parent, I <laughs> look when it happens, like I get this little sinking feeling in my stomach, but every now and again, I will open my mouth and Lowell Stevenson just comes out. It comes out and it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing because what we all try to do and what we all should try to do is take what our parents gave us, filter out the bullshit and try to pull from the best parts. But every now and again, the parts about your parents that annoyed the shit out of you, they're going to come out in yourself. And when it happens, <laughs> you just want to go take a shower. You're like, Jesus, what did I just say? Oh, my God. Like teenage year old. I'm sorry. The teenage version of myself would be kicking my ass right now. But it's true. Like, and it's it's genetics, man. All Some of it you can't even help. But you're more like your parents than you made one to admit. And I think becoming a parent I know for me it has. Becoming a parent has helped me like cut my parents some slack. I realized that parents go through a whole lot more than I thought they did when I was a teenager. And I thought I was smarter than them and I knew everything. <laughs> so, you know, that is one another harsh reality. Um, here's one that I have struggled with and have really been thinking about lately. Uh, if there's one thing I can't stand, it's an ungrateful child. And I am guilty, 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 guilty of wanting to constantly <laughs> remind my kids of all the bullshit that I do for them. And the harsh reality that I've had to come to grips with is that constant reminders of the things you do for your children will not make them appreciate you more. In fact, it will probably cause them to feel like they're a burden and resent you. So I know being a parent is a thankless job and every five seconds your kids are asking for the next thing and it feels like they just don't appreciate anything that you do for them and i'm just here to tell you that that may be the case maybe they don't really appreciate it but oftentimes maybe they do appreciate it in silence and this is what i'm starting to figure out they don't always say it to your face um, but they may talk about it amongst each other they may talk about it to their friends Every now and again on your birthday, they might write a very long soliloquy of a Facebook post telling you how wonderful you are, <clears throat> Maddie. But there are going to be moments where you will feel appreciated. But on a daily basis, it's a very thankless job. But I'm here to tell you right now, constantly reminding your kids that you wake up at 445 every morning and you go out and you bust your ass and blah, 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 blah. They don't. That's not registering with them. I promise you. Like... <laughs> Because first of all, especially teenagers, teenagers just have a really hard time having empathy anyway. But when you're constantly talking about in a negative light, all the shit you do for them, first of all, you're supposed to do those things. And if when I say those things, I would want to immediately go to the mirror and be like, you dumbass, what do you want? A cookie? This is what you're supposed to do. Like, and I get it, man. When you're a parent, like a thank you would be nice. A hug saying, hey, mom, I appreciate you would be really nice. Just out of nowhere. I get it. But if you're constantly reminding your kids of all the stuff you do for them, it makes it sound like you don't want to do it. You don't like doing it, that your life was better without them and they may start to resent you for it. So that's one of those things that I'm really trying to work on because <laughs> I don't know. I grew up old school. Like my, my parents used to remind me of the things they did for me too. Like it's just one of those things that gets passed down to you, but I'm starting to realize it's probably not very healthy. Um, and that leads me to the next one. Your kids are not the same as you were at their age. 
that one is a struggle for me, especially with my son Logan, because I I I know that I've always been harder on him because he's a boy. And I was harder on him because I knew that if something happened to me, he was going to be the man of this house. And I wanted to be able to trust that he would take care of the girls the way I would. And so I know I was tough on him. And I always thought that I would have a son, you know, before, before I met Whitney, before I, when I was a young man thinking about having a family, I always thought I would have a son who would be the spitting image of me, not necessarily physically, but just the way that I am, the way that I think, the way that I make decisions, the way that I reason. And so some part of me when I met Logan thought, oh, he's eight years old. I can turn him into a little Nick Jr., <laughs> right? Um, and that's just not the case. These these are individuals. They're All they are are just little versions of adults. And they have their own personalities and their own ways of thinking. And you can try to instill as much as you possibly can. And there are, even with Logan, I can say I know for a fact there are some lessons that I taught him that have resonated with him not very many at least not yet but there are some and those times that you see it it makes you feel good but your kids aren't going to do things the way that you do and you know what they might do it better they might be a little bit more intuitive they might be a little more empathetic they might be a little more street smart um you can't expect them to just be the the teenage version of you Especially because it's easy to forget that the reason you are who you are is because you went through a lot of things in life. You made mistakes. You experienced things that they have not experienced. And it's easy to forget that. I know for myself, I, sometimes I feel like I just, I was born knowing all of the things that I know now <laughs> and thinking the way that I think now. But that's really not true. Like I did dumb stuff as a kid and it's it's tough because you want to spare them as much pain as possible and so you want to just like get in there like with a video game controller and like have them be your avatar where you're just controlling everything that they do but that's that's not possible it's not going to happen and that leads me to the next one you have less control than you think um i know you can ground and you can punish and you can gps their phone if there's anything that i've learned uh that free will is a motherfucker and your kids are going to do whatever the fuck they're going to do, especially when they stop fearing the consequences. <laughs> like if you have a child who still fears consequences um, in this day and age, like you're really lucky if your child fears consequences up into their preteens or teenage years. Like once they stop fearing consequences, um, they're going to challenge you and you're going to realize you have less control than you think. And my wife and I have had to swallow that fucking pill real hard over the last several months because we could not control what our son did. Um, but the things that our son was doing was beginning to be detrimental to the rest of the family. And that's tough. Um, really tough, you know? Because you just, like I said, you want to get in there and you want to just make them do the right thing, right? And you can't. Um, the seventh harsh reality that I wrote was that raising children, especially teenagers, uh, is going to test your marriage. And, you know, there's this saying, uh, they all say, the first year of marriage, that's the toughest. And I'm here to tell you, b -b 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 bullshit, it is not. <laughs> Man, the first year, no, don't get me wrong. The first year was tough. Me and my wife, we went through a lot before getting married. The first year of marriage, we did deal with many things. But if you asked us right now, can you go back to the problems of your first year and trade it in for the problems that you guys are having this past year? I think either one of us would say in a fucking heartbeat <laughs> because I don't know this, this, and I guess, I guess the experience is different for everybody. Maybe somebody did have a really hard first year of marriage and it was all peaches and cream after that. 
who that person is. I don't know. Uh, they need to write a book and tell people how they made that happen. I just, I don't buy it. I don't buy the whole first year is the hardest. Um, but it's going to test your marriage, especially in a blended family. Cause I don't, when you're in, a, when you're in a blended family, me as a stepfather, I don't feel any different about any of my children. I love Logan and Hannah just as much as I love Madeline, but you find yourself being conscious of the fact that you are not their biological parent. And so it makes you almost paranoid to like, you don't, you want to make sure that it's obvious that you don't love your child more than you love, you know, your quote unquote stepchildren. And it's, it's tough because like maybe you even overcompensate sometimes. And the problem is, is that in that overcompensation, you may be causing rifts between you and your partner that, how can I put this? You're creating a there that's not really there because you're really trying to make sure that they know, hey, this is how I feel. And like for no reason, I'll say things like, and if it was Maddie, I would do the same thing. That's really unnecessary to say. And just saying that probably plants this seed in the other person's head. Like, why are they saying that? Maybe that's not true. Would they really be the same way if it was their child? It's just, it's tough. So there's many times that your marriage is going to be tested. Also, you know, when you're blending a family, you're taking two people from two different walks of life. And this is just the case with marriage of people without kids. And then you're taking two different people, two different walks of life, two different ways of doing things. And you all of a sudden you put them in a house together and say function. And so when you're adding children into it and how are we going to raise them? How are we going to teach them respect and dignity and right from wrong? And what are the limits, the boundaries we're going to set? That shit gets tricky. And you know, if you can't see eye to eye on some of those things, it's going to test. It's going to test you. And my wife can tell you we've we've been tested um, a lot. And we continue to be tested. Um, and I'm really thankful that our foundation was strong and that our foundation was really built on the admiration we had for one another and the way we were raising our kids because – we can always go back to that in the moments where maybe I'm losing sight of who I am as a father, or maybe my wife is losing sight of who she is as a mother. We can always remind one another of who we are. And let me tell you something. When you're in a situation where you're dealing with a child who is just seemingly out of control and it, you get to the point where it feels like we cannot survive with this person here unless something changes. It is very tempting for you to make the change that is made you. Maybe I should just be more lenient. Maybe I should take a different stance on something that I was so confident and had such conviction about previously Maybe I'm the one who needs to change. And that's not a bad thing. I, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with growing, adapting, and taking a look in the mirror and say, yo, am I being a little bit too much of a hard ass on this? Or am I being too lenient on this? Like, where do I need to make the adjustments? Parenting is all about adjustments. But if there's one thing I know that I will never do, I am never going to make the adjustment in the wrong direction. I'm never going to decide that it's okay for my kids to do something that they shouldn't do just so that life is easier on them living in my home. I just can't do that. I've thought about it. I've contemplated it many times. And honestly, I've thought many times that maybe it would make things easier between my wife and I. But at the end of the day, I think, number one, your kids are always watching you. If they see you fall back on the things that you believe to be true, on your morals, if they see you fall back on, you know, your your values and the things that you've been teaching them, now they're going to question everything, first of all. And 
when you when you know for a fact that what you've been teaching them is the right thing, you don't want them to question that. And I don't want my kids to ever question the right, the wrong that I've tried to teach them, uh, the ability to be self-reflective and and show accountability. I don't ever want them to second guess that that is not exactly the way that they should live their lives. Now, are they going to? Do they have to? No. Once they're out of this house, they're going to do what they do, right? But I just, I don't want, there's such thing as compromise, and then there's such thing as just throwing everything that you hold to be true out the window. And that's one thing that I just haven't been able to do. And the tough reality is that maybe that's going to put you in the situation that we're in. Maybe you have a child who can't cut it in that environment. I don't know. I still hold out some hope. Um, You guys got to understand this is something that's actually kind of being processed by me in real time. So we're still trying to figure this thing out. Um, It's tough. It's tough, especially with my son, because one thing I've tried to teach him not to have is pride and be prideful. And I think that there could be a lot of things fixed in our family if it were not for his pride. And um, I don't know. I'm still I'm still optimistic. I'm still holding out hope. Like I said, it's I don't even have a resolution to that particular situation to offer you guys because it is happening in real time. But these are some of the harsh realities that I've learned. Like we, there's not a lot of control we have over the situation. Um, I'm hopeful that he'll come home. If by some chance, son, you're listening to this, uh, I do love you. There's not a whole lot you could do that would ever change that. Um, and I am hopeful that I have given you something in this life uh, that is going to be beneficial to you. And I apologize for the mistakes that I made and the things that I handed to you that were not of good use to you. Um, And I hope you'll forgive me for those things. And I hope you'll do what I try to do. Take the good, flush the bullshit, and be the best version of yourself that you can be. And uh, I look forward to having this conversation with you in person if we get the opportunity. All right. Those are a lot of the harsh realities. Now, I told you we can't just end this on a negative because there are beautiful realities. And as I was writing them, I know I noticed like they all are very closely linked to the harsh realities that we just talked about. Uh, the first beautiful reality of being a parent is that you're doing a good job just because you're trying. There's a lot of people out there who don't try like if you feel like you're failing because you're not getting the results that you want or that you thought you should get I just want to tell you right now you're winning by the fact that you even give a fuck okay you care so don't give up keep trying you're doing the best that you can try to be better apologize to your kids when you mess up we'll get to that in a minute um And just keep trying because you're doing good just for that. Uh, The second thing I wrote as a beautiful reality is the good things you do will also have a long lasting effect on your children. And man, is that a beautiful thing when you see it? You know, we said earlier, being a parent's not a, it's a thankless job. But when you do get that little bit of confirmation that something you did had a positive impact on your child, it's a beautiful thing, man. Um, Madeline, my oldest, the one who I've probably caused the most trauma for through being a baby when she was born and her having to live with all my mistakes. Um, she's really come into her own as a beautiful young woman with perspective. And, you know, she's still, I mean, she's a kid. She's 17. And what? Look about when I when I was 17, she's she's doing good. That's all I have to say, you know, but 
I can see that a lot of the good that I've tried to pass on to her has also taken hold. And, you know, she's in therapy. She's trying to work through some of the bullshit and the drama. And she's doing a great job. And I'm just really proud of her. And my youngest, Hannah, I can see the lessons. I've, I've known Hannah since she was in diapers. I can see the lessons that I've tried to teach her take hold. And I look at the relationship that she and I have and I'm her father and it's a beautiful thing. And, you know, I, I, I mess up with her sometimes. <laughs> she's a very sensitive girl. And sometimes, you know, I want her to get thicker skin. Um, but, you know, sometimes when you have a kid who's sensitive, you just got to let them feel the feelings. And I grew up in a time where you weren't supposed to feel the feelings. It was shut up that crying. <laughs> before I give you something to cry about y'all heard it <laughs> but uh sometimes you just gotta let them feel the feels but when you do notice that the good things you're doing as a parent are also like they're they're gonna take them with them and I look forward to the time that I see my children teaching their children my grandchildren something that I taught them it's gonna be fucking awesome and that's what gives me hope for the future um Another beautiful reality of parenthood is that you and your children can break the negative cycles in your family history. And that is really, without trying to place too much responsibility and weight on my daughter's shoulders, I'm just letting her know, like, everything you think, all the negative, like, we have an opportunity to break this chain, like, Maybe you can be just a little bit more prepared <laughs> to be a parent when you become a parent. And perhaps you can have some children who don't have to be in therapy by the time they're seven years old. <laughs> and perhaps you'll start teaching them some of the lessons that you learned later in life a little bit sooner and just make things a little bit easier. And, you know, you'll take school seriously. I didn't take school seriously. You'll take your relationships and you'll cherish them, and you'll have relationships from the time you're a young child all the way through adulthood. Things, you know, just just do a little bit better. Break the negative. Um, you, it's never too late. I have teenagers, and I'm still trying to be a better parent every day. I'm still trying to break some old cycles. And your children, when they have children, like, you guys have an opportunity to break that negative and keep moving forward with the positive. And that's a beautiful thing to me. The fourth beautiful reality is your kids appreciate you more than you realize, even when they don't say it. I talked about how the constant reminders do not do anything for them or for you. Um, every now and again, though, your kids are going to do something that shows that they appreciate you. Or maybe they'll just sit down and they'll tell you. And it's a beautiful thing. And just don't expect them to say it every day. Don't expect them to say it all the time. Um, on the off chance that you get it and it's not your birthday or it's not Father's Day or it's not Mother's Day, those are the good ones, though, man. Like, those are the ones that you cherish and you remember. I have a poem that Madeline wrote about me. Ironically, right around the time that, like, we were the deepest into uh, the struggle for gaining custody of her and having her to come live with us. And I keep that poem is in the drawer next to my bed um, because she just wrote that out of the goodness of her heart one day at school for no reason. Like, um, yeah, <laughs> just it even gets to me now thinking about it. Um, the poem and maybe I'll get a chance to read it on a podcast one day, but the poem just really said how she felt about me and to come from a young lady, a child. Um, and there was no, she didn't want me to take her to Starbucks or drop her off at her boyfriend's house. <laughs> she just wanted to tell me that she appreciated me and loved me. And she wanted to write it down on paper and I have it forever. Those are beautiful things, man. Those are, uh, you can't beat that with a stick. As I always say, <laughs> uh, that's one of the be many beautiful realities of being a parent. Um, the fifth on the beautiful realities is the same as the fifth on the hard realities. And that's that your kids are not the same as you were at their age. And for some of us, thank God that that's the case, right? 
Uh, my daughter is much more tolerant. My daughter is much more open-minded, um, empathetic towards others, and especially like people who are different. Uh, this is not how I grew up. I've, and honestly, like, I thought that I was all of those things until my daughter has shown me, like, there's another level to this shit. Like, you can really be a loving and acceptable and open-minded person and realize that all people are people. And even when they're different, you just uh, accept people for their differences and, and love them and respect them. And that's part of the effect that she's had on me. And I'm 39 years old. She's 17. Um, but your kids aren't the same as you, and that's a beautiful thing. Hopefully they're better. And uh, swallow your pride if that's the case and tell them. Because uh, <laughs> all that bitching you do about how stupid they are, your kids need to hear how good they are too sometimes. They, want to, they need to know that you're proud of them and that uh, they're doing a good job of being little humans. Um, the last beautiful reality that I wrote on this list was that if you take accountability for the things you did poorly as a parent and you apologize, all your kids are going to remember is the good stuff you did. And I experienced this with Hannah, but mostly with Maddie because there's many times that I will go up to Maddie and I'll say, hey, do you remember when this happened? I'm really sorry for that. And she doesn't even remember. But my daughter can vividly remember all of the positive things that I've done for her. And it's because I've tried to be a person who does take accountability because I want my kids to know that they have to do the same thing. Like, you're going to mess up. And when you mess up, take responsibility for it and try to be better and be better tomorrow than you were yesterday, every day, all that stuff, you know? And I think, I think it's helped strengthen the relationship that could be my relationship with my daughter could be a whole lot different if I wasn't able to take accountability for my mistakes. If I was constantly just pointing the finger at her mother who were not, you know, I, I, there's a lot of that. If you if you're in a if you're in a situation where you're the parent of a child and you're no longer with their mother or father, they're not going to have a whole lot of respect for you blaming everything on the other parent. Like take some accountability. Um, you know, when me and Madeline's mother split up, it would have been really easy for me to just point the finger and say, oh, this and that. But I had to eat the responsibility I had in the situation. And I tried to do that very early on. And I never spoke negatively of Madeline's mother to her. I only ever spoke about the things that I felt like I did wrong. And I think my daughter respects me for that. Um, I think it makes my daughter's relationship with her mother better because she sees someone that isn't in a relationship with her, but still does my best to treat her with respect and honor her as the mother of my child. So um, I think if you if you do that, you're going to be better off than constantly pointing the finger and making excuses and blaming other people. If you can take accountability for your fuck ups, a lot of times that's hard to do because then we have to swallow the fact that we fuck up and then we start beating ourselves up. But it's so much easier for, to forgive yourself if they forgive you. <laughs> and the only way they're going to forgive you is if you take accountability and say you're sorry. Just say it. I'm sorry that this happened. It's hard to do, I know, but it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And that's why I made it on the list of beautiful realities. Um, so... Those are the, that's the list that I came up with. I'm sure each and every one of you probably have different experiences. Maybe some of my experiences um, resonated with you. But I just want to end on that positive note. Like all of the harsh realities that I read off, all of the beautiful realities, it is my humble opinion that every single one of those beautiful realities makes the harsh realities worth it. And 
you know, things are tough right now in my home uh, with my son not living here, with some of the relationships um, not as strongly tethered together as they have been in the past. But one thing I've learned in this lifetime is when you're going through something, it seems terrible at the time, like it's the worst thing you've ever gone through. And then 10 years later, it's barely a thought. And so I told my wife, I said, you know, in 10 years, when we're all sitting at the Thanksgiving table and we're holding our grandkids or maybe our grandkids are playing on the floor and we're all here sitting here talking about the good times and the funny times, we're not going to remember this shit. And I really believe that. And that's what I hold on to every day to keep it pushing. And I want you guys to do the same thing. Whatever it is that's negative, harsh realities of your life, the beautiful ones, you know that they outweigh them. Just wait. Just wait. Because the only thing you're going to remember is the good stuff. So make sure you take the opportunity to build some good stuff. Make good memories. Tell your kids you love them. Um, tell them you're sorry. Just do the very best you can to make sure that what they remember when you're no longer here is the good stuff. Um, and that'll be, you know, part of your legacy, which the third part of this series we're going to touch on a little bit about our legacies and what we leave behind to our children. But that's going to do it for this episode. Uh, it was a little bit bumpy, a little bit all over the place. I got some rust, I know, but I had a good time, and I hope somebody listened and somebody got something good out of it, and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to celebrate my birthday tonight with the people that I love. Uh, we have Madeline's uh, escort banquet. Uh, for those of you who are not in Deer Park, escorts are <laughs> the high school drill team. It's not what you're thinking. Uh, <laughs> she has banquet tonight, so we're going to go celebrate the year that they had. Uh, and then I want to shout out my boy, Joe Lewis, lead singer of Billy Rocks. They're playing at the House of Blues tonight in Houston. So I'm going to go show him some love. And I'm going to uh, make sure he feels appreciated because I've missed multiple of his shows that he's invited me to. Uh, before I get out of here, I do want to give a quick shout out. I don't know if, I hope some of you remember, I don't know how you could forget, uh, on the season finale of season three, my good friend Mike Evans joined us, and he kind of stole the show a little bit. Well, I have a heavy heart, and my thoughts and uh, are with him, because he lost his mother on May 1st. So I want to dedicate this show uh, in loving memory to Betty Lou Jolivet. Um, my brother Mike is hurting. I can't imagine what he's going through. Uh, they will lay her to rest tomorrow in Louisiana. Uh, I'm going to leave the link to her obituary uh, at williamsfuneralhomes.net. Uh, that's in uh, Appaloosas, Louisiana. I'm going to leave the link in this show. If anybody would like to just go write some encouraging words, light a virtual candle, send a gift, virtual flowers, real flowers, anything. Uh, I just would really appreciate if the spirit sniffers would uplift my brother, Mike, because he's hurting right now. And uh, I love you, Mike. I'm sorry that I won't be there tomorrow, um, but I'm always here and you know that. Uh, I'm on the other side of the line and my door is always open to you. All right. Uh, next week, we are going to... Talk about the dreaded boogeyman, the word woke, to be or not to be woke. Um, now, I say next week, as I said, one of the reasons I'm doing these shows on my own is because setting a schedule and linking it up with other people is a little bit difficult. I don't know when I'm going to record that show, and I'm not quite sure when I'm going to release it. It should be in a week or so. That's what I can commit to. Um, but I hope you guys will tune into that. I hope you guys will enjoy it. I hope you guys enjoyed this. And I just want to thank everybody who supported this show over the years. Um, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to be your gracious and humble host. I can't really think of anything else that I want to say. So uh, I love you guys, baby. I love you. Uh, I'm glad to be 39. I want to shout out my mama. I love you very much. My brother, everybody who supports this show, Chris Clark, Josh, Naomi, Chris Khan, I love you all. Uh, I'm going to get on out of here, and I will see you next week. Good night. <laughs>